guys, welcome back to our class. Today is going to be another wrap up day. Yesterday we finished our graphic novel adaptation of Anne Frank's diary. We had some discussion questions on that. And today we are going to look at a different sort of perspective, but that is also relevant and adjacent to Anne Frank and her family. It's going to be sort of the cold case approach to who they think could have actually turned in Anne Frank and in her family and everyone else that was hiding in the secret annex. But before we take a look at that information, I want to wrap up this timeline. We started this timeline at the beginning of the learning unit and it's going to be pretty important for us to see what happens after basically the Frank family is arrested. So 1943 was the last date that we uncovered and now we're moving on to 1944. On August 4th, uh, the Franks are discovered and arrested. They are immediately sent to labor camps and eventually sent to Auschwitz. Anne, having just turned 15, is one of the youngest of her transport spared from the gas chambers for hard labor. In October, Anne and Margot were part of a transport to Bergen-Belsen camp. Their mother was left behind and starved to death. So there we see, and this happened with a lot of Jews, immediately as soon as Jews got to concentration camps, Often they were separated from men and women, and then from there they were separated from death camps to labor camps, and there was just a lot of separation. So families normally were separated and never saw each other again. In 1945, over 6 million Jews have been murdered in the Holocaust. In addition to this, over 220,000 Roma Gypsies, 270,000 disabled people, and 1,900 Jehovah's Witnesses are also murdered. Over 20 million civilians were killed in the Second World War. So looking at this, this is important because while the Nazis had it almost out for the Jews, they were focused on other sorts of people as well. Their goal was to ultimately create this perfect race. And this is just an example of three other groups of people that didn't fit into that perfect race. So there's some numbers and statistics as to other people that were killed during this time and the total of civilians that were killed in total over the Second World War. In 1945, a typhus epidemic spread through the camp in the disgusting conditions. Margot died first and Anne died a few days later. This epidemic killed 17,000 prisoners. So what's interesting to note here is that the reason for Anne and Margot's death wasn't because they were sent to gas chambers. It was because of an epidemic of typhus. And this is ultimately, I believe, a respiratory um, disease. Don't quote me on that. I'm pretty sure it's a t respiratory disease. But point being, the conditions there were horrible and it just led to a spread of this disease. And that's ultimately what killed 17,000 prisoners in that time frame. In 1946, Otto returns to Amsterdam and discovers that his children have died. He reads Anne's diary and is moved by her incredible words. Otto is the only member of the group to survive. So that is, in my opinion, very sorrowing that he lost his entire family in this Holocaust and he was the only person to survive. In 1947, Anne's diary called The Secret Annex is published. So Otto returns to Amsterdam, he finds her diary, reads it, and he publishes it so that her words can live on forever. So that is going to be that timeline. And I feel that this is important for us to just see over the course of years how these events occurred. Now we're going to move on to what I think is actually going to be super interesting and I'm really excited for us to cover this today. It's going to be this cold case approach to Anne Frank and the secret annex and everybody that was there. So before we start our reading for today, I have a new segment for you guys to read that will honestly just put a lot of things into perspective before we read the article. Anne Frank's diary is one of the most read, most studied books in history. The story of a young Jewish girl hiding from the Nazis in World War II. It's also the ultimate cold case, one a retired FBI agent wants to crack. Anne Frank, the girl who dreamed of being a writer and died far too young. That's her 
her leaning out the window, the only known footage of Anne. A year later, she was locked away here. This is the window that was so well documented by Anne in her diary. The attic above her father's warehouse where she wrote about the blue sky, the bare chestnut tree glistening with dew. We have been here now for one year, five months, and 25 days. Her story became an Oscar-winning movie, The Attic, a museum. I call it the most visited crime scene perhaps in the world. A crime retired FBI agent Vince Pancoke is hoping he can finally solve. Whether someone tipped off the Gestapo, leading them up these stairs in August 1944, through the attic door hidden behind a bookcase, and sending Anne Frank to her death at a German concentration camp. But we do have probably over 10 very solid leads, good information coming in uh, from relatives of victims and also relatives of suspects. The only suspect ever investigated was Willem Van Maren, a worker in the warehouse below the attic. The case was dropped in 1963 for lack of evidence. Now, Penn Coke and his team are using forensics and profiling and finding new clues in recently declassified Nazi files. There is an enormous amount of data possibly relevant to this investigation, far more than we could possibly investigate. So they're using artificial intelligence, building a first-of-its-kind database of millions of documents spread across archives in Israel, Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, Britain, and the U.S., asking the computer to connect the dots. Already, it's given them this map. Anne Frank's hiding place is in blue. Every other dot is a Nazi sympathizer. How did they last for more than two years without being discovered? Because danger was all around them. All these buildings here, buildings down there, this very block, there were sympathizers. The investigation is still in the early stages. The team not looking for a prosecution, just answers. For the girl who wrote, in spite of everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart. The team says they've had more potential witnesses come forward and found a treasure trove of Nazi documents in U.S. archives. You can follow their progress on coldcasediary.com. They hope to have answers on the 75th anniversary of Anne's arrest next August. And thus begins our look into this cold case file that is Anne Frank and her family's arrest. Super engaging, super interesting. Like the video said, they had hoped to have this solved by the 75th anniversary of their arrest, which was, keyword was, August 4th, uh, 2019. The video that you just watched um, was posted on YouTube in December of 2018, and it is now March of 2020. So clearly there's a lot more to unpack here, hence why it has taken them this long to be able to solve this cold case, but they are still working on it. There is still information that they are uncovering as well as suspects, clues, and in this article that we're going to read, you're going to get to see the process that they're using. You're going to get an idea of what kind of technology they have, as well as the information that they're looking into. On the screen, you will be able to see the article. It will be there. It's kind of small, so I definitely would encourage you to use the packet that I gave you. So that way you will be able to see the information much clearer. Please feel free to mark the text right in the margins because you will need all the information you can for the wrap up, wrap up activity for this reading. So without further ado, let's get started. Who betrayed Anne Frank to the Nazis? A team of FBI and police investigators is working to solve the 75-year-old mystery, and they may soon have an answer. Now, there are going to be some names in here that I believe are German, and um, while I may be German by nationality, I do not know how to speak German, so I will do the best that I can with these names. On the morning of August 4th, 1944, Carl Joseph Silberbeyer, head of the Gestapo's Jewish division, received a phone call from an informant about Jews hiding at 263 Prinzengracht. Within hours, his team had successfully raided the secret annex and arrested its eight occupants. 
Over the seven decades since, there have been plenty of theories, suspicions, and investigations into who tipped off the Nazi intelligence agency about Anne Frank's family, yet no one has been able to uncover the truth. But in 2020, we're closer than ever. Cold Case Diary, an international team of 20-plus FBI and police detectives, criminologists, forensic scientists, profilers, historians, and data scientists, led by retired FBI agent Vincent Pankoki, has been dedicated to solving the mystery, and they're equipped with the most advanced technology to date. So real quick, I just want to take a pause, and I want you to think to yourself, what kind of technology do they have that would be able to aid them in solving this case now that they haven't had in the past? Obviously, there's been a lot of advancement in technology, especially technology that helps crime and solving those crimes. I want you to write in the margin what kind of technology you think that they have that is going to help them ultimately solve this case. So go ahead and take a minute, make some predictions, and then we will go ahead and keep reading. All right, so you're back, which means you've made a prediction. Now we are going to go ahead and continue reading this article. Back in 1948, at the urging of Otto Frank, Dutch police carried out the first investigation into the betrayal followed by a second in 1963 after Anne's diary received international acclaim, yet neither turned up any conclusive evidence. Apetta foreman Willem van Maren was the main suspect, and the video touched on that. But there were huge gaps in the questions, leads that weren't followed up, many logical steps that weren't taken, Pankoke explained in an interview with Australian morning talk show Today Extra. Not only that, but back then, they weren't able to utilize a lot of the modern investigative techniques that we have today. So that kind of ties back to what we just discussed. Technology, as well as the investigative techniques that they have, have changed since this event occurred. Artificial intelligence, computers that mimic human cognitive functions like problem solving, has been the greatest asset for Cold Case Diary. Their investigation involves combing through millions of bits of information, a mammoth task that no one person would be able to complete in their lifetime. But with software developed by Zomnia, a big data company in Amsterdam, the overwhelming amount of evidence is processed by algorithms that draw connections and determine specific clues for the team to then follow up on. So this is kind of giving us a little bit of that answer with our predictions the biggest asset that they have to really hunkering down and trying to solve this case is a software developed by a company named Zomnia, which is in Amsterdam, that takes the millions of bits of information that they have and puts it into an algorithm, which ultimately rates it by importance and then gives it to people to actually review. And that is how they are, one way that they're able to work towards solving this cold case. And that's not all. Their database, the first of its kind, also generated an interactive map of Amsterdam, noting the locations of all Nazi officers, collaborators, sympathizers, and informants, as well as local raids of Jews in hiding and their proximity to the annex. Now, we're gonna take a quick break from this article and I want to reference, and I'm gonna be blocked, that's okay, but I wanna reference this map. This was in the video that I showed you, and this is the map that they're referring to. It might have changed since they've done this video, which like I said, was in 2018, but you have that blue dot, which was the secret annex, and all the other dots around it are gonna be those Nazi sympathizers and collaborators, officers, basically anybody that has any tie to the Nazis. So as you can see, there is a ton of people around them that are ultimately going to want them to go to those concentration camps. So it's just important to note that they were in an environment and they were in an area where it's honestly a miracle that they didn't get discovered sooner, which lends to the question again, how did they get discovered? The benefits of such technology goes even beyond Anne's case. 
Since we're casting such a wide net over the information, we've actually been able to solve a different betrayal, revealed Pankoke, another Jewish family that was arrested in the nearby area during about the same time period. So here we see just how influential this, um, how influential the technology that they have is. Not only are they working to solve this case, but in the process, they were able to solve another case that was of Jews getting betrayed and arrested. I want you to really think about this. Why is this relevant to the article? I can give you the answer. I can tell you the answer, but I want you to really think about why is this relevant? Why would that information need to be in this article? It has nothing to do with the Franks case. The Franks case still has yet to be solved, as far as we know. So why is that relevant? I want you to take about 30 seconds to a minute again, right in the margins. Why is that information relevant to this article? All right, welcome back. Hopefully you guys are able to make some predictions, write down your information and why you think that that information is relevant. But we're going to go move on and we're going to focus in on Anne Frank's case. Before any of this could be achieved, the team first had to collect the information to be uploaded into the system. So this is going to give us the information as to what information was ultimately important for solving this case. Beginning in 2017, they scoured millions of documents relevant to Anne's arrest, including recently declassified Nazi files at archives in Germany, the Netherlands, England, Belgium, Israel, and the U.S. At the end of World War II, allied countries took possession of Nazi records, so that's important to know that most of the records that they're finding are in the allied countries, not so much in um, Germany and the Axis powers, because the allied countries took control of those documents and spent endless hours translating, reading, and decoding the bad writing. During one of these missions in Washington, D.C., Pankoke hit the jackpot, a list of informants kept by the Gestapo in Amsterdam, as well as payment receipts for Dutch traders, most notably Peter Schop, who received 10 guilders for betraying someone on pod fun names, Pot Gitterstraat, less than a mile from the annex. So here we have information that shows a Dutch trader who ultimately was working for the Nazis, who received payment for betraying someone less than a mile from the annex. Interesting information. Could this be related to the Anne Frank case or could this be a completely different case? With the preliminary research completed in March 2018, the team moved on to the investigative phase, looking into old clues and hundreds of new tips they received from the public. One source in particular claimed to currently live near 263 Prince and Croft and identified their neighbor as a one-time Nazi collaborator. According to Pankoke, who splits his time between the US and Amsterdam, the second and third generations out from World War II are more willing to talk about what happened or what they've heard from their family members. So again, quick pause. Um, I'm not going to have you write anything down. We're going to discuss this briefly because this is something that I feel that is important in understanding how the solving of this case is going to be different now than it would have been back in World War II when the event actually occurred. The quote from Pankoke states, one more time, I'm going to read it, that the second and third generations out from World War II, which are ultimately like great, great grandchildren of the people who lived during World War II, are more willing to talk about what happened or what they've heard from their family members. So this quote is important because it lends way to understanding that the people who are living now, who have relatives back from World War II, whether they have were Nazi sympathizers or Jews or just regular Joe Smo, they're more willing to talk about it than if you had asked the people who were actually involved. That has a lot to do with the fact that they're not as afraid to hide it because they're not the ones that are going to get in trouble. That also has to lend with the fact that we've 
discussed this topic quite a bit since it actually occurred, and we've been able to analyze why the event occurred, how it impacted our world, what it stemmed from, the ultimate racism and anti-Semitic values that were there because of it. There is a negative perspective on the Holocaust in the sense that it was a tragic event, but we have learned that the only way to keep from repeating that event is to be open about it, to discuss what happened and how we can keep that from happening again. That'll be something we'll talk more about tomorrow. Sure enough, we're going back to the article. Sure enough, by the end of that year, the team could enjoy the fruits of their labor. What we do have is probably over 10 very solid leads, Pankoke revealed to NBC News. Good information coming in from relatives of victims and also relatives of suspects. Like I just said, we've got the victims and the suspects. They're much more willing to talk about things now that the event has occurred quite a bit ago. One of their informants might be surprising. Helper Bep, not going to say the last name because I can't seem to pronounce it for the life of me. Her son, Jupe Van Vick, uh, revealed in his 2018 book, and Frank, the untold story that his mother's younger sister, Nellie, was a Nazi collaborator and may have been the one who betrayed those hiding in the annex. The possibility was so strong that the team reached out to Van Wyck and he was interviewed several times about his aunt Nellie, among others. His years of research, including firsthand accounts from family members, also interested Cold Case Diary, and they utilized much of it for their investigation. So here <clears throat> we have one of our first real suspects that's being discussed in this. We had our first one, which was um, William Van Maren. He was one of the people they suspected from the beginning. They had to drop the case because they didn't have enough information. And now we've got Nellie Bepp's sister. Growing up, recalls Van, Van Vick, a recurring theme in my family after the war was the tension surrounding the matter of Nellie's contact with the Germans. Yet when he questioned the situation, my parents carefully avoided the subject or downplayed Nellie's Nazi link. But when he spoke to his mother's other sister, Denny, in 2012, it turned out she had an entirely different version of that. Um, the Nelly story. Denny didn't shy away from speaking the unvarnished truth about her sister during the war. Two years later, he met with Bep's former fiance, Bertus Holzman. He didn't hesitate to discuss any subject like Denny, adds Van Vick, and he too brought all kinds of bits and pieces of the puzzle. So here we've got Nelly, we've got Bep, who really doesn't talk a whole lot about it, but then we've got other people in the family who have no problem discussing this and they will give different bits of information that Bep is not willing to give. So that just is another example of how other perspectives ultimately is going to lend different information. Another person who provided important clues is a Dutch born American named Edith Chut Chutkow. During the Holocaust, her Jewish father was a professional photographer who documented the Nazi occupation and how it affected the lives of Jews, and several of his photo albums were recently donated to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Chutkow's mother was a Gentile, which, just to be clear about this, a Gentile is a non-Jew, which allowed her father to be sent to a work camp for Jewish men married to non-Jewish women. So Chutkow, who now lives in Williamsburg, Virginia, was able to avoid deportation. Because her family had lived a few blocks from the annex, Pankoke was interested in what life was like on the outside during the time the Franks were hidden, she explained to the Virginia Gazette. And during their five-hour discussion, I was quite able to fill him in on that. As an ode to Anne, Pankoke kept an online diary during the early days of, in of his investigation and frequently provided updates on the cold case. In, March, in a March 2018 entry, he teased an interview with a Holocaust survivor in the Washington, D.C. area who <clears throat> may have been Chutkow. I hope to learn so much from her about what it was like and how she was protected and provided for, he wrote. <clears throat> she could have been partly depending on the same network in the neighborhood of the annex. 
Besides that, for myself, I think this interview might give more insight into the peculiar situation prior to Anne's arrest. Also, while in Washington, D.C., Penkoke met with a male Holocaust survivor for a really interesting conversation he revealed in February 2018. The unnamed man not only provided him with a lead, but also microfilm he hoped would contain some clues. It's a strange story, though, if not fantastic, added Penkoke. Did this person really interview a police officer in the 60s that was involved in the Anne Frank case? So here we see there's a variety of people actually that have these connections to Anne Frank's case and are able to give information on this case. We have yet to really see where this information yields, where it leads us to, but hopefully once they are able to release this information and hopefully solve this case, we will see all these connections really just sort of form each other and see all of these connections form together and create the map and the web that we're looking for to solve this case. Throughout the Cold Case Diaries investigation, they've had the support of the Anne Frank House and also the benefit of their own knowledge. Jerton Broke, the museum's historian who conducted his own two-year probe into the betrayal, has served as an advisor for the team. Cold Case Investigation Cold Case Investigation implies reviewing the whole body of work, that has been done before, he explains. Mr. Pankoke occasionally consults me about insights or opinions I have regarding old and new information. This is something that is interesting to consider. It's not like it's something that happened like a year ago. This, the information that they have is from an event that occurred 75 years ago, more than 75 years ago, pretty much at this point. And this is information that has been reviewed already, that has been looked at, but they're still looking at it and they're still hoping that maybe a new set of eyes or an algorithm or something somewhere is going to lend to that break that they need and they're going to uncover the truth of who betrayed the people that were in the secret annex. Although Broek's research suggested ration card fraud accidentally led to the annex raid and not betrayal, he praises Cold Case Diary as an interesting endeavor. Likewise, Anne Frank House Executive Director Ronald Leopold welcomes the perspective of a third party. What is new about this one is that it looks at the case with forensic eyes, and we look forward to the results. When will that be, when that will be remains to be seen. When the investigation was first announced, Pankoke hoped to close his case on August 4th, 2019 to coincide with the 75th anniversary of Anne's arrest. Yet, after HarperCollins acquired the rights of Anne Frank, A Cold Case Diary, the landmark publication was set for a summer 2020 release, which would be this year. But that has now been pushed back even further to 2021. After three quarters of a century, they are in no rush. There's no statute of limitations on the truth which is very important and very true, says Pankoke. This is a fact-finding investigation. We're not going to prosecute anybody. In fact, anybody that we're able to develop as a suspect has probably passed away by now. But I think we owe it to the victims, and we owe it to all of the people during that time period who suffered through the Holocaust and lived. I think it will show that the world has a conscience. And then there is a quote at the bottom that I feel like is really just kind of important. So we're going to read that really quickly. Part of the story is being lost to the sands of time. If we accomplish nothing else, and I'm certain we will, we are bringing attention to the issue. And that ultimately, I feel, is one of the biggest factors of this. And one of the biggest reasons that I feel that this case is important. Because they're right. They can't prosecute anybody. They can't arrest anybody for it. Because more than likely... Whoever did it is probably dead already, but it brings attention to the issue and it really just shows like this is what happened. This was the injustices that occurred to Jews like we've discussed throughout this entire learning unit. There was mass injustice that occurred and that happened to the Jews, but we need to pay attention to this issue and work to make sure that it doesn't happen again. So that is going to be the article. And now what I want you guys to do with the remaining time that we have is we have the top seven suspects. You have this in your packet. I'm going to show you this briefly. 
these next two pages are going to have information that I want you to read through and I want you to figure out what's important. We have William Von Maren, Lena Van Bl these names are just so fun. Lena Van Blatter and Hart Hartog, Anthony Tony Allers, Joseph Jansen, Nelly Vascujul, Martin Cooper, and Anz Von Deitch. Fun names. That is what I want you to read through. And then when you're done reading through it, I have a activity for you guys. I want you, and I have it right here. So this is, if this is the piece of paper, you have this paper. And I want you to put the information and the evidence for each suspect in this graphic organizer. And I want you to provide evidence that is in the article as well as the end section. And then identify at the end your prime suspect. So you're going to have all the evidence for each of these seven suspects. And with that evidence, you yourself, this is more of an opinion thing, but I want to see some thought in it. I want you to decide who you think did it, who your prime suspect is. All of these need sufficient evidence, sufficient detail. I don't want just one to two words in a box. Give me some evidence. You've got all the information you need. And then when you're telling me who your prime suspect is, don't just put a name. Tell me why you think that they are the ones who did it. So that is going to be what I want you to do for today's lesson. Thank you guys so much for your attention, your participation, and I really hope you guys enjoy reading through the list of suspects.